Hey, River Valley Church, uh, with all that has happened in our city uh, and in the world, what has happened in our city with George Floyd losing his life and his life being taken on that street, um, it has caused our whole world to stop. And as I said before, it has awakened in us a desire not to move past this moment, but to see this as a moment to change, as see this as a moment to speak into this. And I believe God wants us to do something with this. I believe God wants us to address this, to uh, change and to bring solutions to a world that desperately needs that. And uh, I asked a friend of mine, Miles McPherson, to join me and uh, I, I, you'll meet him and you'll love him. Uh, he serves on the ARC board with me, the Association of Related Churches. We help start other churches because we believe Jesus is the answer for the world and so we're trying to start more churches. And uh, he also spoke at a conference that I started called 1000 Plus. He spoke just this last uh, winter, right before the world shut down with COVID and uh, spoke to a bunch of ministers that are leading in the nation and spoke to us about the third option. And in all that we're facing in our city and in the world, I said, would you please do this? He jumped at the opportunity. He wants to help our, our city, the church, and you, and uh, I'm so thrilled. Miles, thank you for being here. I love your book, I'm devouring it, and I love our friendship. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, our heart goes out to your city. The whole world goes out to your city, so we're praying for all y'all. Thank you. Um, we, we've never dealt with anything like this. Um, it's been a, a crash course in this, and I know we're doing things wrong, and we're trying to do things right. And I've been saying people to people, like, judge our direction. Please don't judge us by perfection. Judge us by direction, because our direction is towards good, towards solution, towards healing. And uh, man, I'd love for you to speak to us. You wrote this amazing book, Third Option. You have lived this. And uh, I defer to your expertise and I defer, and I, I wanna speak to our church very clearly. I believe you're apostolic. You're not just a pastor. You have an apostolic, and nobody should be afraid of that. That's a great term. That means there's an anointing that he has to be a leader to help expand the kingdom of God. And so I want you to speak to us. And, and uh, as you go, I'll interject, but could you, could you minister to us? Could you minister to us? Yeah, yeah, hopefully uh, minister, challenge, encourage. Um, I, I grew up in New York, I have uh, two black grandfathers, black white grandmother, half Chinese black grandmother, they're all passed away. So that, therefore I have this nice cocoa brown skin. I grew up in a black neighborhood, went to school in a white neighborhood, and I experienced racism in both. And now that I'm 60 years old and I saw what happened, I, something triggered in me that I never knew for 60 years, that I have lived my whole life with this sense of, of varying degrees throughout my life of, of powerlessness. That act was a symbol of powerlessness. And it was an exercise of power over one group over another, one individual over another. And it hit me last Monday and I've, probably cried every day since then processing what this means and what it has meant all my life that I have sensed this powerlessness to the white culture. And that's what a lot of minorities feel, that we are less than. Our lives are not as valuable as white lives. Uh, our lives are not, um, uh, we're not made in the image of God to the degree that white people are. We're not as significant that we can be killed uh, done, some, done unjustly, and it doesn't matter. We won't get the same justice. And so when I saw that, that's what triggered in me that I've been feeling all my life. Um, and that's what a lot of people are feeling now, and they're just erupting, saying enough is enough. Um, and I've been encouraging people in the church, in the community, uh, here in San Diego, that white voices are stronger than black voices. You need to understand this, because uh, people of color deal with race all the time. And um, so we deal with this every day, and whites don't have to. But your voice is more powerful than black voices, and we need you to speak. When in the NFL, a lot of times, leading up to this year, leading up to this incident, a lot of black players would be very uh, frustrated with white players, especially quarterbacks, because their voice was so powerful, but they weren't saying anything. Now they're saying something. Um, so I wrote this book called The Third Option, because in every race conversation, in all culture, you have us versus them, which is exactly what you're seeing. And the us is people against the police, 
and the them is the pol police. And, and that's what we've defined as us first them now. There's another us first them, black versus white, whatever you want to call it. So there's this us versus them, and all of us are in an us club, or I should say a group, and everybody outside our group is a them. The third option, which is what the book is about, is how do we honor what we have in common? Because as soon as you identify us, you assume everybody else is your adversary. When Joshua was walking into the promised land, he was confronted by the command of the Lord's army, and he said to the command of the Lord's army, are you for us or our adversary? In other words, if you're not for me and us, you must be our enemy. And that's what the culture is. If you're, uh, if you're, you're either for the police or you're against the police, there's no middle ground. You're either for Republicans or against Republicans or, or for Democrats. There's, you, can't, you can't be both sides. And if you do anything for the other side, you're a sellout. The third option says, no, 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 no. We, are, we all have more similarities than differences. And if we can focus on those similarities, we would all get along better. Um, and so one of those is that we acknowledge that we all have blind spots. All of us, there are, all, all of us have things we don't know about other people. One of those blind spots is that you can be racially offensive and not be a racist. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and said, well, I'm not a racist. If they say something that's offensive, I say, well, you, I don't know that you're not a racist. Maybe you're not. But it doesn't mean that what you just said or did is not offensive. And, and one of those things is saying you don't see color. This is a very common thing that people say, that I don't yeah. see color, and I get it. You're trying to say everyone's the same. That's what you need to say. Because when you sell, tell a person you don't see color, what you're saying is I don't see you. Uh, I'm not looking at you, I'm looking past you, and I'm not gonna acknowledge the burden that comes with the color that God gave you, because in this country, this color has a different burden than white people, and by the way, this color has a different burden than someone very dark. Because sure. in this, in this <laughs> the darker you are in this country, the more menacing you are. And so when we say we don't see color, we're invalidating not only the, the amazing design of God, but the burden that comes with that design because of our culture. And by the way, whites are color as well. There's a great theologian and philosopher, Fred G. Sanford, <laughs> People don't know who he was. I do, but our church doesn't. He was a comedian, yeah. and he got, he got robbed. He, he had a show called Sanford and Son. He was a junk man in, in, in South Central Los Angeles, and he got robbed in this one episode. And a white cop comes and said, was the perpetrator colored? And he said, yes, he was colored white. In our culture, you have white people, and then you have people of color, as those are two different things. We have two different experiences. We have multiple experiences, but in God's economy, they're all colors and they're all different shades of the same color. And so the third option helps us look past, helps us understand those things to build bridges versus to build walls. I love that you talked about too, that you have biases, that you have unknown, like us group biases and them group, and you give more grace to your group, if, you know what I'm saying? And we should give it to everybody. Talk about that. Right, so all of us are in multiple groups and, and like one of my groups is men, another group is senior pastors, another group is dads. Those are all groups. And if you are one of those groups, you're a part of my in group for that particular group. If you're not in that group, you're part of my out group. When we identify our in group, whether it be your, your gender or your ethnicity, your nationality, you give in-group bias, which means you give preferential treatment to people you're more comfortable with. It seems like a very natural thing, and it very is because you're comfortable with them. The problem is, is that if you give preferential treatment to the people who look like you, it's called racism. And so if someone walks in, they look like you, and another person walks in, doesn't look like you, and you say, I'm gonna treat you better because you look like me, and I'm gonna treat you worse. I'm gonna be less patient, less kind, I'm gonna have less, neg less positive assumptions. All this is in the book, by the way. Um, yep. Then I am, I am slighting you. Now, you may say you're not a racist without knowing it. You're, you're treating them negatively. So you can call it whatever you want. But if you're treating someone negative because they look different, what do you call that? And so we have to understand the Bible says to love your, love your neighbor as your friend and love your enemies like your friends, like your neighbor. Love your out group like your in group. It's very, very, it's very simple. You know, the Bible says that the greatest commandment 
is to love God with your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is, is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So why is there so much division in the church? Because we take that word neighbor and we replace it with something that's dehumanizing. And so as soon as we see somebody that's different, we can call them something that dehumanizes them and disqualifies them from me having to love them. And so when, you, when, when people of color see something happen to them and they don't get justice, what the system's saying is that you are less than my neighbor. I don't need to give you justice. And that's what Black Lives Matter means. It just says, can I matter as much as you? That's all it means. Can, can we get the same justice that white people get? Can a poor person get the same justice as a rich person can get? It's really not that complicated. It's, it's not anything menacing. Now, it may look menacing to you, but I'm telling you, I have felt less than all my life in, 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 the, in the culture. And, and though I'm thriving in my life and I got stuff going on, it's still this, you know, it has gotten less over the years. But there's still this cloud of you're not really at that level. And that killing of George Floyd was the ultimate statement of powerlessness. Um, and that's what, a lot of what you're seeing. Now, you talk about that people have an internal less than. They don't realize they're made in the image of God and they live with almost a inferior feeling and they have to grab hold that they're made in the image of God. Speak to anybody that's feeling inferior or less than to, to break out of that. Actually, it's learned. Um, when you get told your whole life that you are less than, when you get when you see on TV, you know, that people like you are gonna have to work a little harder, you're not gonna get the breaks you're gonna get. When you watch on TV that people like you don't get justice, you start to just accept it or you start to uh, you know, uh, internalize those negative messages. Um, and so it's, it, that's why it's important for all of us to acknowledge that we all are made in the image of the same God and if we can see that in people and speak to that in people and speak life to people when you see people who are treating themselves in a self-destructive manner. And by the way, this is not about race. This is people who self-destruct in all drugs and dating yeah. abusive people. It's because there's something inside, something was told them that they're less than. And if we as believers in the almighty God who made us in, in his image, he made us in his image for many reasons, but one of the benefits is that we can speak life to people. And yes. that's what we need to do now. We need to speak life to people. And one of the ways to do that is to put an honoring label on them. When you give someone a label, you can't see them outside that label. If, you, if, you, if someone is ugly to you, you say, that person's ugly, it's going to be very difficult for you to see beauty in them. If, someone, if you say someone's stupid, it's going to be very difficult for you to accept them as intelligent. When I was a kid, I used to watch the Cowboys and Indians, and the Indians were savages. They weren't human. They were savages. They were less than. And so what we have to do is put an honoring label, the Son of God, made in the image of God, anointed, blessed, forgiven, yes. destined. Yes. And you put yes. that label. And by the way, you can put that label on someone that's walked away from God, that God has loves them, God has destiny for them. God wants to do something amazing more than they can ask or imagine. And if we put that label on every single person, even the per people that are looting, I don't agree with the looting. I think it's counterproductive. I think it's offensive to George and his legacy. However, even those people are made in the image of God. And, and we are going to see programs for the next five, ten years about people who looted and are on television say, I was wrong. I made amends. I brought this stuff back. Uh, I, I was convicted. We will see, we're already seeing it here in San Diego because they're made in the image of God. And that's what we have to speak to that and pray to that. Yeah, uh, so good. Now, you talk about blind spots. And can I just say this, like, when, when you said the term, like, it's racism, most people are like, no, racism is like the really bad guys, you know what I mean? And you don't see your blind spots. You don't even realize that bias or slight, just small things, it doesn't mean you're oppressing people, but you are hurting people and you're hurting them, blind spots. Well, yeah, blind spot is the fact that you don't know what you don't know. Um, I, I'm left-handed. This is my left hand. I know it looks to the right to you, but I'm left-handed. Most of you watching are right-handed, 
and the world was made by right-handed people for right-handed people. The desk at school is on the right side. If you're right-handed, you can go to a golf club, golf shop, and get any golf club in for right-hander. But if you're at school and I'm left-handed, I have to, I don't have anything to rest my elbow on because I don't have a desk over here. It's only on the right side because it was made for right-handed people. And if you're right-handed, you don't know those disadvantages that left-handed people have. You can go to a golf shop and get all the drivers and putters and all everything in right-handed the first time you go. If a left-handed person wants to get that, he has to drive around or she has to drive around in multiple stores and maybe have to order it online. It's called right privilege. It's the privilege of having the advantage that culture was designed for you by you. Now, if you're right-handed, it doesn't mean you have anything against left-handed people, but it also doesn't mean, because you don't know about that, that the disadvantage of left-handed people doesn't exist. This is the same in, in race, that there are people saying, I can't get a job, or I got treated bad. And you're saying, and that never happened to me, so it probably didn't happen to you. You're making it up. The, the other day, there was a lady in New York City who called the police and said an African-American man was harassing her because he was asking her to put a dog on a leash. And he filmed it. Obviously, you probably saw it. And, yes. and he was a Harvard grad. And I had a friend tell me, white lady said, if I didn't see the video, I would have believed the lady. The assumption is that the white lady was right. And so when we live in that culture that's, that has the, the, the advantage, the blind spot is I, if you don't live, if you're not left-handed and you haven't experienced that side, you think it's made up. And now that we've seen what happened to George, we realize that uh, th those things do happen. Now, I, I, I cannot recommend your book strong enough for our church. I bought it for my whole staff. And um, can I just say, Pastor Miles, like, pastor us right now. Pastor our church. Our church is hurting. Um, I'm seeing people fighting. I'm seeing people angry. They're judging harshly. Um, our city's hurting, but our church is hurting. and. I'm a healer, I wanna bring healing, and uh, I'd love for you to help us heal right now. I think I have two stories. One is uh, in Mark, I believe, chapter nine, when God, Jesus cast out a demon of a little boy, and uh, the disciples tried to pray him out, and they couldn't. Jesus comes on the scene, and, and the boy throws, gets thrown on the ground, he's wallowing at the mouth, foaming at the mouth, and Jesus casts him out in 17 words. Right before demons are cast out, they usually lash out. And they usually start to convulse and make a big deal because they're trying to threaten, scare you away from the solution. They're trying to scare you away from casting them out. I believe there's a demon being cast out of our country right now. It's a, it's a spirit of bigotry and power and anger. Um, and, and anger, is, some of it is justified. Um, uh, pride, uh, power, lording over people, dominance. Um, superiority, supremacy, that spirit, I believe, is being exercised. It's painful, it's ugly, it hurts. Um, we have been hurting a long time, um, and we're so thankful for the for our white brothers and sisters that are coming to bear our burden with us. I would tell you to stick it out because the, the, the good is coming. When David killed Goliath, David, the, Saul said to David, you can't kill the giant because you're nothing but a kid. And David said, in the past, I killed a lion and a bear when it came after one of my sheep. When bad things, I just did a sermon called When Bad Things Happen, not why. When bad things happen, what do you do? Think about the past. And I want to tell you, just like David, look at the past and what God has done. I want you to look at the past, the times that God got you out of a, out of a, out of a situation that was impossible. You individually, your church, your city, you had impossible situations, disasters, whatever it was. Your freezing cold that you have every year is, is a disaster. But all the stuff that we go through, and every time, God gets us through. And so instead of looking forward and trying to project, project how, is this, how are we going to get through this? How is it going to end? Look at the past and all the amazing miracles God has done in the past. He's never been defeated. He is the only undisputed heavyweight champ of the world. He is going to get us through because he, he is he's going to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. So I want to pray over your church, pray over yeah. your city, and pray that the Holy Spirit will fall in your city and state and, and flow all through this country. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are almighty God. We thank you that you are faithful, you are powerful, you are wise, you have everything in place. You didn't cause this, but you are right on time. You are gonna come through with your salvation, not only of souls, but of situations, of environments, of relationships, of economies. 
And we pray that on the state of Minnesota, the city of Minneapolis, we pray for a supernatural miracle of peace and reconciliation and unity and build, bridge building, break down all the walls. We pray that a revival would break out on that state and flow through all this country and in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.